according to our program, our discussion together, dear brethren, is the will of God. It may interest you to know that there are 21 verses in the New Testament that include the phrase, the will of God. And five of those verses are found in the first chapter, first verse of First and Second Corinthians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Second Timothy. For a topical text, dear brethren, as we study together on the subject, the will of God, will be found in First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verse eighteen. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. Now we recognize, dear brethren, that, that the New Testament in part was written for the little flock. But we understand, dear brethren, that there is a principle for us to understand. And that is, in everything give thanks giving thanks for our spiritual blessings that come from above, our gracious Creator. In everything give thanks. What is giving thanks? It's an expression of gratitude and appreciation. Expressing a gratitude and appreciation for everything primarily for what the Lord has done for us. If we are to be worthy recipients of God's favor, we must give thanks. Otherwise, dear brethren, we will become impoverished. There is another thought, dear brethren, that truly, supremely, the first thought is to give thanks for all our spiritual blessings that we have received. Not only for the toward and untoward experiences that we have experienced, but for the rich love that God has had for us, so expressed in that familiar talk, uh, familiar verse in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We have the privilege, dear brethren, to give thanks above and beyond the world of mankind. <clears throat> Not only do we give thanks in spiritual things, dear brethren, but to be cognizant of the blessings that we received by other people. Things that people have done for us. Thank you. Perhaps the, uh, the most used expression in the English language. Thank you. We recall, dear brethren, at the time of our Lord's crucifixion, and he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Who was the first to go to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea? The dear sisters. When I first came here, who was here first? But the dear sisters. I met Sister Kathy for the first, very first time. I have met Sister Carol, Sister Pat. I know Sister Betty. I've met her several times. And I thank them for putting candy on the tables and make it, making this room very warm 
having a very warm atmosphere. Dear brethren, the main thought of our talk here today, or our study, I should say, is giving thanks for God's works of creation, revelation, providence, redemption. I don't know if some of you or perhaps all of you <coughs> remember our dear brother Jolly. He used to say to us, never live beneath your privileges. Always give thanks for God's plan of salvation, which is the main, uh, or the, uh, our, our Lord Jesus' crucifixion, his death, his sacrifice upon Calvary's cross for the world of mankind. There isn't a day, he would say to us, there isn't a day that we should give praise and thanks to our great God and his beloved son for the sake of the ransom. After redemption, dear brethren, comes instruction. Are we not receiving instruction here this day? Let us give thanks and praise to our Heavenly Father. And what comes after instruction? But justification, sanctification, deliverance. And the works of God in future ages to come. Now we have this thought, dear brother, expressed to us by our dear brother Johnson, in Nephi 8, page 700 and 701. Now you and I would talk and say, gee whiz, um, that's rather unusual. Uh, yes, I, I would agree that creation would be first, uh, deliverance would be last, what, what about in between? Our dear brother Johnson explains to us, dear brethren, that the little flock movement that was started by the Apostle John through his gospel in the book of John, the, his epistles, and his, the fact that he was the amanuensis, a recording secretary, of the book of Revelation. It was actually our Lord Jesus that wrote the book of Revelation, and it was the Apostle John who wrote Revelation. Our dear Apostle John said that Jesus had a pre-human condition, and that he had a human condition, and that he has a post-human condition. And this was in opposition to the Gnostics, which were mystic Christians, if you will. And they believed that Jesus was nothing more than a corporal human being. Far from the truth. In Jesus' pre-human condition, dear brethren, he was God's active agent in creation and giving revelation and provinces. In his human condition, he exercised his office as the vicegerent of God, his special representative, in redemption. And in his post-human condition, he exercises instruction, justification, sanctification, and deliverance, and future acting as God's vicegerent in future works of God in future ages to come. 
Now, dear brethren, you will also find that there are other references relating to all of these nine works of God, with the exception of Revelation and the future works of God throughout future ages to come. We find this thought, dear brother, and, and we, we make mention of this because in order to eliminate any confusion as we, as Bible students, this is what we are, dear brother. We are Bible students. Religion was not intended to be made into a business. I'm sorry, I didn't say that quite correctly. Our love for God was not intended to be made into a business. Freely have received, freely give. I've lost my thought. All right, I guess we'll have to move on. The thought, dear brethren, is that you will find references in P.T. 1942, page 37, bottom of the page. You will find our, there, our dear brother Rick Johnson will share with us that he describes the works of God as being sevenfold consisting of creation. Providence, redemption, instruction, justification, sanctification, and deliverance. However, dear brethren, we, we don't want to be confused. We understand that God has future works in, the, in future ages to come. And he describes, dear brethren, that there are nine works of God and that Jesus is God's special representative, his special agent. The reason why our dear brother Jonathan shares with us that there are seven works of God is because God is exercising aggressiveness in these seven forms or works of God. Because out of partly in love for righteousness and partly hatred for wickedness. We are to give thanks, dear, uh, dear brethren, wholeheartedly giving thanks. We want to be God's worthy recipients of his loving favor. We desire to please him. Now, part of our text in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verse 18, we will notice that in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. I don't know about you, but don't you, de don't you desire to be appreciated when you do something nice for somebody? God is no different. He desires to be appreciated also. He wants us to give thanks for the, his works. For whose benefit? For yours and mine. You can't put the love, you can't put thankfulness and gratitude and appreciation into my heart, nor can you put gratitude and appreciation and thankfulness into your neighbor's heart. You can't put gratitude and appreciation into the person that is sitting next to you. This is something that each of us must develop on our own. 
just as we exercise our consecrations. Do you want to be famished? Do you want to be impoverished? No, dear brethren, we don't. We want to be worthy recipients of God's favor. God has a lower primary grace of appreciation. For us, it's called approbativeness. Having an appreciation for what we do for others. We have the privilege of giving thanks, dear brethren, for ultimately God's works, all of God's works, will honor him. Our Lord Jesus was to act as his special agent representative in all of these works. However, our Lord Jesus was involved in creation. We know that by John 1st chapter verse 3, that in all things, Jesus created all things that were existed. And that is true. However, there's a caveat to this. What do we mean by caveat? C-O-V-E-A-T. Caveat is a noun, which means caution. There was the first feature of creation where God acted as his own representative, his own special agent, when he created his only begotten son. We know, dear brethren, that the expression begotten son indicates the fact that Jesus was created. And secondly, dear brethren, that no son is as old as his father. And that the very fact that a son who has been created has been created either indirectly or directly by the Father as a source. Jesus was the God's special agent. We also understand, dear brethren, that, that these works of God in the gospel age for the church and in part later for the world that we be in different forms used toward toward uh, used toward the church but we have the privilege dear brother the blessing the opportunity of giving thanks to God in God's works the world of mankind has no knowledge no understanding of God's works but we have this blessed privilege of giving thanks. The more we exercise our consecrations, dear brethren, the greater the blessings that we receive. We reach plateaus that we have never <coughs> dreamed, that we never imagined that we could be so at peace as previous brother has just shared with us a peace that passes all understanding Let's briefly discuss creation, dear brethren. Next to the creator comes creation. In the opinion of the natural learned men, 
of today. Creation appeals to our five senses, knocking at the door of our perceptive faculties. Creation challenges our reasoning powers and seeking an entrance into his affections, God's affections. A part of creation such men as astronomers and explorers and physicians and having a feeling of his relationship with creation, with his mother earth and the human body because he is related to it. It brings him into a closer relationship with his all-wise, powerful, just, and loving maker. Subject of creation, brethren, brings the Bible student into a deeper knowledge and appreciation for the Creator. It follows that it brings the individual into a closer touch with his all-wise and powerful maker. In a gradual process, in time, he reaches the condition of consecration that ennobles, enriches, and elevates the individual. That God becomes more and more of a living reality to him and more and more the goal of his endeavor. There is a scripture, dear brethren, that I would like to share with you relating to man's creation. And it's found in Psalms 139th chapter, verse 14. Psalms 139th chapter, verse 14. Understand, dear brethren, that physicians marvel at the creation of the human body. Isn't it amazing that this little bitsy piece of, uh, uh, of an organ allows us to see and to perceive and to touch and to recognize light and darkness and color? Isn't that truly amazing? And listen what actually man's feelings are as described in Psalms 139th chapter. Beginning with verse 13 and 14. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvels are thy works, that my soul knoweth right well. Human body, human mind, what a wonderful creation. It would seem, dear brethren, that the first creative act of our Lord Jesus was creating the seven orders or ranks of spiritual nature. Now, our dear brother Johnson shares with us in E. Volume 2, page 86, bottom of the page, where he explains that in Hebrews 2.16, he shares with us that there is no question that the Logos, or Michael the Archangel, was of a higher spiritual nature than the cherubims, the seraphims, the principalities, the thrones, the dominions, uh, powers, powers and mites are the ones saying, and angels. 
It is his thought, dear brethren, that associated with their names, if they were not a reflection of the various natures of spiritual nature or spiritual beings or spiritual angels, if not, it certainly is an expression of the orders and ranks of these angels. Now, I would like also to share with you, dear brother, in, in uh, First Colossians, the first chapter, verse 16. Colossians, the first chapter, verse 16. For by him were all things <coughs> created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, where they be thrones, did we not just mention thrones, dear brethren, as one of the spiritual angels? Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. It would be reasonable, dear brethren, that our Lord Jesus did not create the universe, if you will, by himself. That they, that they, no doubt, assisted our Lord in the creative process. As the angels were involved in creation, revelation, providence. They are also involved in giving uh, honor and glory to our Lord Jesus as we all are very familiar with in uh, second, uh, Luke the uh, second chapter verse 8 through 10 behold I bring you great tide, uh, great tidings of great joy which shall be to all people this was an angel uh, Colossians the first chapter verse 16 I just read that. I'm sorry. I just read that scripture. Short memory. One, oh, one, one last thought, brother, and I'd like to share with you is uh, found in, in uh, uh, Job, the uh, 38th chapter, verse 7. Job, the 38th chapter, verse 7. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. This was related to the creation of the universe. The creation, the foundations of the earth. Uh, verse 5, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hast stretched the line upon it. Verse 6, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who hath laid the cornerstone. Of course, there is an involvement of the of construction and uh, design of the Great Pyramid as well. But these these angels, dear brethren, they were they rejoiced in having the ability to be part of creation, and then they rejoiced in uh, seeing creation. Revelation, dear brother, uh, very quickly. Uh, Revelation, the first chapter, verse 1. Revelation, the first chapter, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show us unto the servants things which must be shortly come to pass, 
And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. You see, dear brethren, our Lord Jesus was the author of Revelation, and that the Apostle John was the amanuensis, a recording secretary. There is other, another scripture that I'd like to share with you regarding to Revelation found in Daniel's the second chapter, verse 47. Daniel's the second chapter, verse 47. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and Lord of kings and revealer of secrets, seeing that thou couldn't, couldn't reveal the secret. <laughs> we have the thought here, dear brethren, the fact that God is a revelator in his works. Um, our time is up, brethren. I'm, I'm sorry, and maybe, maybe it's a good thing. Uh, but uh, uh, we certainly have the wonderful pro uh, providence, providences that uh, God has exercised in his uh, works, and Jesus as his revelator. Um, There is one final thought, brother, if I may, brother Phil, if I may. Um, there is one thought I'd like to share with you found in Nephi 12, page uh, 232. And this is what Brother Johnson said regarding to redemption. The whole plan of redemption revealed in the Bible is pivoted upon two things. Man's condemnation to the curse in Adam by divine justice for Adam's sin. And man's ransom from the curse, condemnation, by Christ through his righteousness unto death as Adam's and our Ransom in Adam. And may the Lord add his blessings to these thoughts. Amen.